All right, everybody, it's Friday, so let's do another episode of Network Address Translation. So this is going to be part three, and this week I promised a demo, so I'm going to try and put this together for you. So just as a reminder where we've been, right, Network Address Translation is sort of described in RFC 3022 as the IP Network Translator, and we use uh, RFC 1918 private addresses when we deploy network address translation. And the whole idea is that you take uh, non-global private addresses and you connect them to the internet, or as we know now, through another NAT box, but the outside interface of your router, the thing that's the gateway to your network, is going to act on behalf for all of the other hosts behind the router. And so we translate the internal or private addresses to the external or public addresses. And remember that we're dealing with the client-server architecture. So the things that become important to us are the source and destination IP addresses, the source and destination port numbers, and then whether or not it's TCP or UDP. And that constitutes our socket. So this is what I was sort of talking about earlier. How does it work? Uh, any internet connection gets identified by that socket. And then what we're going to do is build a table. And we're going to take the numbers that we start off with and modify the matched pair of matched pairs to include or to be translated to the outside interface. And when transmissions come back, they go back to the outside interface, and then they're translated back to the inside private network addressing. So that's kind of what's happening here, right? Transmissions on the way out get translated, and then they get transmitted back when they come back in. Uh, so we're going to, we're really, what we're going to have is the socket on the inside and the socket on the outside, and then do the translation between the two. Here is the base configuration that I'm going to use for the demo. And as you can see from the configuration here, I've got uh, two interfaces. And I'm going to identify one of them as being the outside NATed interface, and one will be the inside. And then my outside interface is going to be connected to the RIT campus network. So I'll be getting a DHCP address from that network. And then um, I'm going to configure the inside manually. And then I'm going to describe how I want my NAT to be done. I'm going to use an access list. And for those of you that think access lists or have been taught so far that access lists are just for security, really an access list is a container. And in this case, I'm going to be using it to describe what is going to be translated. And that'll be my access list there. Okay, so a couple things to think about as we're doing the demo. Uh, I'm going to accept all traffic that matches the access list. Now, I'm not controlling what traffic goes in or out, but rather what traffic is going to be translated or natted. Uh, and that's what the access list is for. And then that goes into my NAT statement, and the NAT statement says, okay, I'm going to take the access list as input, and then I'm going to use this particular interface as my NAT interface to, um, to describe or to determine what public address I'm going to use or what outside address I'm going to use and then um, overload that keyword there says well I'm going to only use this outside uh, interface as my IP address which means that I'm not dealing with a pool or static one-to-one -one mappings or anything of that sort okay so without further ado let's go ahead and do the demo Okay, here we go. We're going to try this again. This Today's video is definitely not an advertisement for Camtasia. I've tried three, four times to get this to work, and it's blue screen my machine every time. So I'm back to fraps. So here we go. <clears throat> so we are taking a look at our uh, IP NAT configuration. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to work on the interfaces first, and this is just right out of the... Uh, Rather the, the example I had in the video. So let's go to int f0 slash 0. I'm going to make this my inside uh, interface. So I'm going to give it an IP address on the network that I specified in the example. Uh, there we go. And let's do a no shut to bring this one up. And uh, let's also uh, make this my inside NAT. So I've been at inside. And if I go over here real quick, what I've done on this host, this is really the only thing that I had done. Oh, let me bring, uh, let's bring my wireless interface down first. 
We'll get rid of that one. And bye bye to you. Bye bye bye. All right. So there we go. So now what I should be able to do is ping my default gateway. Hey, look at that. That works. Okay. So back over on the router, let's go to my outside interface. Now this is connected to the uh, the campus network, so we'll see what kind of fun I can get away with here uh, running this router behind the nap box, or as a nap box. But first, uh, let, me, uh, let me give this guy an IP address. So remember that uh, since I'm connected to the campus network, what I'm going to do is ask for an IP address via DHCP. Now, in full disclosure, I did register this MAC address with the campus. I'm going to do a no shut, and it looks like I pulled an address, so that's good. So maybe I had already no shutted the interface. Oh, no. Are we off here? I just crashed. I have to make sure that's... Oh, no. Putty, 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 what have you done? All right, I guess we'll be back in a minute. Okay, hopefully we can recover from that. I think what I did was the was the interface. I had to reboot again. Uh, so I'm going to do this again just, uh, just to make sure that I had it done. Okay, in the example I'm using ACL, so we got to do that. Remember that the ACL is there just as a container to decide what I'm going to NAT and what I'm not going to NAT. So what I am going to NAT is that inside network. All right, so that ought to do it. Okay, but now what are we going to do with this access list? Well, we're going to use this in conjunction with a NAT command. But before we do that, let's try something here. Um, I'm going to just try to ping out. Now, we know that we can ping my default gateway. Whoops. So we know that I can talk there. But what happens if I try to go all the way out? Let's see what happens there. Huh, this doesn't look good. And the reason that it doesn't look good is because I'm on a private networked address space. So that means that even it, though the campus can actually get through my router, it doesn't know how to get to this particular network because the router uh, upstream of me has no idea where the 192 address is and has no idea that, I'm, that I have it behind my router. Okay, so let's fix that problem. And the way we're going to fix it is we're going to hide it and then do translation of addresses. So, and I'll do this based on question marks so you can see uh, how this works. So I'm going to do an IP NAT command here, but then what am I going to do? I'm going to translate my inside addresses, but how? Well, the um, I'm going to use that access list right here, right, as the collection of inside addresses that I'm going to translate. But what am I going to translate them to? And the answer is that I'm going to use this interface. You can see here that I could have used a pool, but I'm just going to use a straight up interface that's on the outside of my router. But which one? Well, if you remember that I had my outside interface, it, <laughs> my outside interface specified as F0 slash 1. And then the last thing that we're going to do is overload, which describes how we're going to use this interface. And that ought to do it. So now if we go back over here, does this work? Hey, all of a sudden it works. Well, that's all nice. So our, we actually have a fully functioning NAT router right now, but, but what's actually happening? So I'm going to do show IP NAT translations, and this is the translation table that shows me how this is working. Now, what I want to do first is let's do a web page. Okay, so I'm going to do something very simple. I'm just going to open up a browser. And that browser is going to automatically go out to the web and with its home page. In this case, the fabulous BruceHartFence.com. So now if I go, whoops, that's not what I want. Minimize you again. Now if I look at my translation table, what I see is all of these recent port numbers that I was using for this website. So they're going out through my router. So this is the outside interface of my router. And he here are... Whoop.
Sorry, we had a communication coming in that interrupted us here. So we see port 53, of course, is my, um, oh dear, we locked up again, looks like. All right, port 53, this is, of course, we know is DNS. And there's 443, we've got some SSL happening here. So these are all TCP and UDP streams, as we can see along the, the left-hand side here, right? Uh, and so that's the socket that I was talking about when dealing with client server. So what happens here is that here is my inside network address, my what we call our inside local. And this is where I was, a lot of this stuff is where I was going, and here is the the global address that I'm going to be using instead. So what happens is the transit or the transmission goes out using these addresses here in this column and they're translated to these addresses on the outside. And so they go to the same destination and so when they come back the router uses this table again to describe how to retranslate them back in. So that was IPNAT translation, this guy right here. But the other thing that I want to point out is that here's ICMP. And hopefully this, even though it's crashed, uh, I can do this without uh, losing the data. Here we go. So here's ICMP. Well, how does ICMP work? ICMP does not have TCP or UDP port numbers, but yet still clearly I was able to ping to the outside and it was translated. So the answer here is in my packets. Now I'm, I'll, I'll do this quick just so that we don't waste a lot of time on it, but the important thing to, to realize is that I'm not dealing with a port number, I'm dealing with an uh, ICMP ID number. And so that's how ICMP traffic survives being natted. No port number, no socket. So let's go ahead and, uh, and ping outside. All right, if we look here, and I open up my ICMP, hey, look at that. There's that identifier of 1. If we go back over here, hey, look, ID of 1. And that's how you keep things separated. All right, I think that'll do it for our demo. Uh, you can see here that, um, I'll just show you real quick. This is my IP address here, is on, here I'm pinging. And so back over on my router, here's my IP address, and that's where I was pinging. But of course, on the outside of the router, it'll actually use this 129.21.24.222 address going to the same destination. And there you have it. Um, I'm crashed here, so hopefully you picked up the config lines uh, as I was doing them. Uh, and that'll do it for the demo. Okay, let's get back to business here. So we talked about what NAT is, how it works, and all the components that go into it. And then we did our demo. Are we all ready to go? Everything okay? Well, not exactly. Remember that uh, the NAT box is only as good as the configuration. So there are lots of problems that NAT boxes create and lots of problems that can be created for them. Throw kind of weird kinds of packets, wrong sizes, all that kind of stuff and it gets right by the filters that you may have set up. Um, in addition, NAT rewrites the headers and things like that. So there are there are all kinds of things that go into uh, into the NAT configuration. So you can do a little bit better job on filtering and controlling what you try to translate. But also remember that just because you're translating it, uh, your ACLs are not being used to filter traffic at that point. You're just describing what you want to translate. So you might have a different set of filters that actually kill off unwanted traffic. So that's why I say combine that and filtering uh, as two different processes if you're really trying to control traffic. Of course another way is to use more than one box to, to handle all that because NAT as you saw from the translation tables uh, translation tables get big real fast and so they can be quite a performance hit if you're trying to ask one box to do everything. All right, um, let me see. Uh, I've got here that NAT doesn't necessarily hide the inside address. So earlier on I mentioned that some people think that NAT is a security thing. And while it does hide the inside network, theoretically, 
Um, that's not what its purpose is. Its purpose was address management. And here's why. This is a voice over IP header. It's SIP, Session Initiation Protocol. And what I've expanded here is the application layer header. And you can see that there are all of these IP address information included inside this header. So just because you're running that does not mean that your IP address is hidden all the time. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. And of course, the key is whether or not you know when it's exposed and when it's not. So that's why NAT is not a security tool. It's just there for address management. Now other problems. Headers are rewritten. So if you have anything that's looking at the headers and, and looking for very specific information, once it goes through the NAT box, the header is rewritten and, and the IP addresses that you might be looking for are no longer there. That also means that the header checksum must be recalculated. And this is one of the reasons why, in addition to the translation table, a NAT box can be slow. And then there's this whole question about how you run a, a server behind a NAT box. Well, you have to port forward to that server, which is, of course, what all of us do when we're running things at home behind our Linksys gateways or what have you. Now another interesting question is about layer 3 VPNs. The minute you spin up a, a VPN, uh, VPNs encrypt above layer 3, which means you can't see the socket. And so you can't do the translation. So that's why a lot of boxes do what's called VPN pass-through. And of course we already talked about how ICMP survives NAT, trans trans <laughs> NAT box traversal. Well, that'll do it for this one, and that concludes our NAT segments as well. So I'm not really sure what we're going to do next. I'll think of something this week. Um, yeah, maybe something a little more advanced policies or, or filtering or something like that. Well, thanks very much for watching. Thanks for listening, and may your packets always reach their destinations. And remember, hey, it's networking. You can do this.